Uh, yeah, quick introduction to myself. Uh, actually, Marco should be standing here and not me. Um, so that that's very sad. Um, but yeah, here we go. You have to listen to me instead. Uh, I'm Max, software engineer uh, at Protocol Labs, um, working on LibidB in general, and then uh, working a bunch on Rust LibidB. Uh, yeah, you can reach me either here at the venue or over the many, many different digital ways out there. Cool. OK, what is LibidP? Um, everyone who's here is familiar with LibidP. All right, why are you coming to an intro session to LibidP? <laughs> OK, who here has never heard of LibidP? <laughs> OK, cool. Who here has used LibidP? OK, and who here is running code in production? Using LibidP? One, two, three. Okay, cool. Okay. All right, wonderful. So, what is LibidP? Um, for those not that familiar with it, um, LibidP is a modular peer to peer networking stack. And the big slogan uh, here is LibidP is all you need to build peer to peer applications. Um, obviously, we don't fully live up to that promise, and peer-to-peer -peer is still very difficult. But I'll go into a bunch of things on how LibidP makes your peer-to-peer -peer life easier. Uh, LibidP is one specification which is implemented in many different languages. Um, you have many of the language uh, maintainers here, like you have Nim over there, you have Rust over there, uh, you have JS over there, uh, you have more Rust over there. So all the peop a lot of people working on any of these implementations are actually here in this room. Um, yeah. LibidP, um, given that it is implemented in all these languages, it can run in many different environments, browsers, mobile, embedded, standalone, like servers, laptops, and so on. Um, and it was initially part of IPFS. It was the networking layer of IPFS, uh, eventually extracted um, out of IPFS. That was not during my days, but I think Jacob, for example, can tell a big story around that if you're more interested in that. Um, and then, so it's today powering the IPFS network, but then many other um, networks out there, like, for example, Ethereum 2, now with Merge, um, Filecoin, Polkadot, um, and we'll go in a couple of other projects using it. Cool. And then to give you a sense of a scale, but uh, that's always very, very hard to peer-to-peer -peer networking. Um, I would estimate around more than 100,000 nodes to be online at any given point in time. So more than 100,000 LibidP-based nodes being online at any point in time um, during the day, the week, and so on. OK. All right. Um, I'm think rethinking my slides a little bit, as most of you are already familiar with LibidP. But we can go through a bunch of these um, anyways. And I think we can still make this interesting for those that already know LibidP well. Um, LibidP has a bunch of building blocks. And these are somewhat abstract, I would say, if you don't put them actually into real use cases. Um, so what I would like to build with all of you along the way with the talk is a chat application. Um, so yeah, we'll highlight the many building blocks and uh, highlight on how we can use them in our chat application. So LibidB building blocks. Um, we want to build a decentralized chat application, let's say. And then uh, LibidB is the tool to go, obviously. Um, and we have different building blocks on the left and on the right. The, the building blocks on the left allow us to make point-to-point -point connectivity. So how do we connect from A to B? And then uh, the building blocks on the right allow us to build on top of this abstraction, being able to communicate between two points and actually build peer-to-peer -peer applications on top. So large-scale networks over multiple connections. Cool. Let's dive into this. First thing, uh, transports. Uh, they, well, they allow us to get bytes from A to B. That's relevant for our chat application. We want to send messages from A to B. So uh, that's really something we want. Um, it depends um, which transport to use, really depends on your environment, right? If you're standalone, like a server or a laptop, or like you have full access to your operating system, then you can do TCP and Quick. 
Um, if you're in the browser world and you're a little bit more restricted on that platform, you would use WebSocket, Web Transport, and soon WebRTC. Cool. A couple of things that I want to highlight here is um, we have a talk by Martin, 1045, on browser connectivity in general. So if you want to learn more on how to connect your browser, that's your talk to go to. Um, then uh, I hope I pronounced this correctly, Gorka, where are you? Yeah, over here. Uh, is going to give a talk on WebRTC, on how to connect to browsers with each other with the help of QR codes, which is really exciting. And then uh, Ryan and I are going to give a talk on the recent efforts on standardizing WebRTC for Lib2P, and uh, also Ryan is going to give a demo on that. Cool. So once we know how to send bytes from A to B uh, for our chat application, we want to secure those bytes. And um, what secures channels pretty much just gives us is authentication um, and encryption for the bytes that we send from A to B. The number one rule in Lib2P is um, no traffic ever touches the wire uh, unencrypted. Everything is always encrypted along the way. Um, some transports already give that to us, basically for free, built in, a uh, quick web transport to see. But then other transports, we have to bring our own encryption as Lib2P. So that would, for example, be TCP with noise and TLS. Cool. All right. Um, we can send bytes from A to B. We can secure those bytes uh, on the wire. Now what we want to do is make great use of a single connection. And given that Lib2P has many, many protocols running on top, those were the one I showed on the right side, um, we want to give each of that, those protocols a virtual connection. So we want to give them like the perspective of being the only ones on the connection. And we achieve that with multiplexing. So we can basically run multiple streams of bytes over a single connection. And each of those streams of bytes seem like they're their own connection. Uh, some transports already give that to us, quick web transport broad CC. But then some others we need to upgrade with our own uh, muxers, like Yamux and Mplex. And that would be, for example, TCP and WebSocket. Cool. Now we know how to send bytes from A to B. We need to, we know how to secure those bytes on the wire. We need we know how to multiplex. Um, next up is net traversal in peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, the biggest pain point probably is firewalls and nets. Um, every laptop, you can assume pretty much every laptop always running behind nets and firewalls. Um, every browser for sure. So what we need in Lib2B is net and firewall traversal. Lib2B has different mechanisms for that. Uh, one is UPnP, basically automatic uh, port forwarding. We have a hole punching mechanism. We also have relaying and so on. Um, this is a very interesting part. I don't think we can dive into that in the intro. Uh, we have a whole talk on this by Dennis over here. Um, so he'll dive us, walk us through net hole punching and I think also show some cool data on the net hole punching. Wonderful. All right, so we're done with the left side. We now can send uh, bytes from A to B. We have full connectivity. That's wonderful. And now with these building blocks for our chat application, we can send messages from A to B. We want to build larger scale things, right? We want to build on top of these abstractions. And the first thing we need to do is we need to discover other peers. Um, Lib2B has different protocols for that, like for example, MDNS, Rendezvous. You can also discover other peers through Gossip Sub. Um, yeah. So once you start your chat application, you should connect to the network and this way discover other peers in the network. The next one, uh, a hard one, uh, is routing. Once you discovered random peers in the network, you probably want to connect to specific peers. Like, let's, for example, say Dennis and I want to have a uh, one-on-one -one chat in our chat application. Then I would like to find Dennis somehow in this network. And um, our routing later, mostly implemented via Kademlia, allows, us, allows me to find Dennis, make a connection, and then exchange messages directly. Um, on this one, we have Pitar um, give a talk on the power of two choices, um, which uh, dives deep into Kademlia itself and uh, the routing tree that we have with Kademlia. Um, yeah. uh, Pitar is also one of the authors of the Kademlia paper. I highly recommend reading the paper. I think it's a really cool read. And then also, obviously, join the talk later on. Uh, unfortunately, Pitar can't make it here, so that will be uh, via Zoom. 
So fingers crossed for the internet connection here. Cool. Then next up, um, we have mes a messaging layer. Let's say in our chat application again, um, we want to make a group chat. Now, obviously, if we are all in the LibPDP track group, it doesn't make sense for me to be connected to everyone. But instead, um, what we're doing is we have protocols like GossipSub, where I'm just connected to a subset here, and I send a message to a certain topic. Other people subscribe to that topic. And then uh, my message is spread through the network by being forwarded across peers. Um, for those in the client-server model, that's basically a pub-sub model. Um, wonderful. On this one, we actually have Ankit, Ankit up here, um, uh, giving a talk on form analysis of gossip stuff. Uh, yeah, very, very happy to have you here. Mm, wonderful. Okay, so we can discover peers, we can route to specific peers, I can send messages to a whole group. Uh, and last, obviously, I want to share videos in group chats. So we need a data exchange mechanism. Um, that would be BitSwap in our case. Uh, there are multiple in case you followed the other tracks at the conference. Uh, this is just one of many. BitSwap basically gives you a mechanism. Um, if I have a video file and I want to share it with all of you, I could send the video file to all of you individually. That will not scale, given the amount of people here. Um, so instead, BitSwap basically gives us a smart way to um, send that video file to everyone. Uh, a little bit similar to BitTorrent for those familiar. Cool. All right. Um, as you can see, we have the point-to-point -point connectivity. We have um, the, the building top blocks on top of point-to-point uh, -point connectivity. And as I said, this is really all you need to build peer-to-peer -peer applications. All right. Um, a couple of more things on the ecosystem in general uh, I want to touch. Um, yeah, and then we have Steve on the stage after that. Um, there are may, there's one specification of LibDB and then many, many implementations. So for example, uh, Go LibDB, Rust LibDB, JS LibDB, but then many, many more out there. Um, and we'll also have a talk by Tangri up here uh, on Lim, Nim LibDB, uh, which is very exciting. Um, projects using LibDB, well, IPFS, I mentioned that. LibDB was initially the actually like built into IPFS as the networking layer. Um, this is a uh, yeah, wonderful use case. I mean, I don't have to convince you here at IPFS camp well, <laughs> on, on IPFS. Uh, it's, a, it's one of our largest networks uh, in the sense that, again, hard to measure, but around like I discover with my ex uh, crawler like 70,000 uh, nodes over 12 hours. Uh, I th I'm guessing Dennis will discover something else. Um, we'll have some numbers later on as well. Cool. Then another network, uh, Ethereum 2. Um, and this is quite exciting. I know the font is impossible to read back there. Um, but the exciting part about um, Ethereum 2 is that we have high client diversity in the sense that Ethereum 2, uh, the, cl the client side is implemented in many different languages. And each of those languages and implementations use the corresponding LibP2P implementation. So each of the colors here, on the one hand, is a different Ethereum client, but also a different LibP2P implementation. And yeah, they're compatible on the network, which is wonderful to see. Uh, another network is Filecoin. Uh, you maybe heard a bunch about it during IPFS camp. Their big challenges are like, how do we transfer big chunks of data from A to B? And I think that's a great challenge for LibP2P in general to tackle. And then another one is Polkadot, um, mostly focused on Rust LibP2P, um, also um, one of the larger networks using LibP2P. I want to also highlight Bertie. I think Bertie is always the perfect uh, way to explain LibP2P, like as the chat application. Um, this is basically what we were striving for today in the, in the intro. But yeah, if you want to see how to do uh, chat, uh, chat uh, with LibP2P in a sophisticated way, you want to check out uh, Bertie. And then the last project I want to uh, highlight is Persia. I'm probably mispronouncing this, but we have uh, Elliot give a talk on Persia and using LibP2P to take over the world. I'm, I'm curious uh, how you're going to take the world, uh, take over the world, but We'll have you talk at uh, three. Big goals, big goals. Okay, cool. Um, 
I think two more slides here. Where is Libby2B heading? Um, a little bit on the road mapping side. Um, I think a big theme for us um, from the protocol lab side was browser connectivity in the last couple of months and probably will be uh, in the next uh, upcoming month. Um, then another one is low latency efficient connection handshakes uh, with Lib2P. That's a super important topic. How do we um, reduce the time for f uh, to first byte metric? And then uh, last week, comprehensive interoperability testing. You have seen on the Ethereum side, like so many people using Lib2P and so many people using different implementations of Lib2P in a live network. But we want to mirror that into our testing infrastructure so that we can properly test in, uh, interoperability. Here I want to highlight Laurent's talk over there. Um, Laurent will. Um, guide us through how uh, we're testing Lib2B with TestGround and hopefully slowly onboarding all the implementations uh, to test compatibility across implementations and across versions. Cool. Um, yeah, that's all for Lib2P. How to get involved. Um, it's an open source project. Uh, all the code is open source. But I wanna, what I want to stress and what I want to strive for uh, is that Liberty is not only an open source project, but an open community project, in the sense that uh, not one company just drives it, but everyone can influence it. Um, yeah, so talk to us at the venue, everyone here, and that would be wonderful. We have documentation forms, specifications, um, the implementations are all public, uh, the roadmaps are public, we have a community call. And lastly, we also have Steve uh, present uh, on how a lot of this is being built within protocol apps and outside. Cool, that's it. Thank you.